Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your SETI Institute uh, colloquium series. Uh, my name is Frank Marchis. I'm a senior researcher at the SETI Institute, and today will be the host of uh, this event. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Andy Skemmer. Um, Andy got his uh, master and uh, PhD at University of Arizona in 2011. Um, he's, he's then moved to uh, stay in the University of Arizona and joined, joined the observatory to, L to build an instrument for the LBTI. Um, he, become, uh, he became in 2014 um, a Nobel uh, postdoctoral fellow and in 2016 joined us uh, in California here to become assistant professor at University of Santa Cruz. Uh, 2016 was a great year for him because he also received the, uh, a Sloan Research Fellowship. Uh, it's kind of a fellowship that uh, helps uh, young early career uh, scientists and uh, to stimulate fundamental research, especially in the field of uh, astronomy. So Andy is involved in uh, plenty of uh, projects, uh, specifically uh, project uh, implying the characterization of the atmosphere of exoplanet and the search for new ones uh, with adaptive optics, imaging, and spectroscopy. So if you know me, you know that I work also in the field of uh, adaptive optic systems. So that's one of the reasons I'm here introducing uh, Andy today. Um, he has developed a uh, novel instrument and uh, observational techniques to improve our ability to see very faint planets uh, near bright host stars. Uh, is very interesting in instrumentation that expand our ability to image exoplanets at a variety of wavelengths and spectral resolution. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Andy Skimmer. Thank you. Thank you. It's really great to be here, um, and I've enjoyed my short time in California um, and being you know, near a, a center of technological excellence. When you talk about uh, imaging extrasolar planets, it's actually a very straightforward scientific problem. Uh, you know, we, we have a bright star and there's a faint planet very, very close to it, and we just wanna be able to take a picture of it and separate its light into different wavelengths and study its atmosphere. So uh, the science that we're trying to do is very straightforward. It's very similar to the science that we have done in our own solar system over the last 50 years, but now we're trying to do it farther away. And so it becomes a technological problem. And I started out a little bit more as an, as an observational astronomer, and then have slowly found myself moving into instrumentation um, and the technologies that really allow you to do these sorts of things. Um, so uh, I recently moved to UC Santa Cruz where I'm gonna continue that sort of work, mostly with the uh, Keck telescopes um, in Hawaii, and also eventually the 30 meter telescope, in, uh, which is um, being planned for the next 10 years. So how many people here, this is uh, very near NASA Ames, I noticed when I'm driving in, how many people here know about the Kepler spacecraft? Show of hands, oh great, okay. So uh, the Kepler spacecraft uh, really completely revolutionized the field. We now know of thousands and thousands of exoplanets. We know where they are, we know how many there are. And so understanding, finding the exoplanets and just understanding their populations, I wouldn't say it's a solved problem, but it, it's, it's actually starting to get there. Um, in the inner parts of solar systems, we have a very good idea of how many planets there are and where they are. So to me, the next uh, big thing that we want to do in the field of exoplanets is understand the individual exoplanets, characterize them, know about their atmospheres, know what they're made out of. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty difficult problem, and so they, it requires very specialized instrumentation, and that's what I've been working on. So today I'll be talking about characterizing the coldest exoplanets. This is a bit of a new talk for me. Um, but the idea here is that we want to move on from uh, studying the freaks, the really hot planets, the things that are a little bit easier to do that we can barely do now. What are the steps that we need to take to characterize more normal exoplanets, which, we we, which, which would be pretty cold? So um, when you talk about, uh, why am I talking about temperature in particular? This is a little bit unusual. Most people, when they talk about different types of planets, the first thing they mention is the mass. Oh, this is a one Jupiter mass planet. This is a three Jupiter mass planet. This is a, a super Earth with uh, two, two Earth masses. But actually, when you talk about characterization, it's really the temperature that makes the biggest difference. So uh, here, if you look at our own solar system, imagine you took Jupiter and just uh, moved it closer to the sun. You didn't change its mass. You just move it a little bit closer to the sun. 
its properties would totally change. It would look like a completely different planet. So uh, the cloud layers, the, the ammonia clouds, the ammonium hydrosulfide clouds, they would all go away and you'd be seeing deeper into the planet. There might still be water clouds depending on where you are in this sort of 300 to 500 temperature bin. If you move in even closer, uh, all of those clouds go away and you're kind of like what we would call a T-type brown dwarf. Your planet would look very similar to that. So those types of, of objects would have, um, their, their atmospheres would be dominated by methane chemistry. They'd be pretty close to cloud free. If you moved even closer in, actually some clouds would come back. Now you would get things like silicate clouds, clouds made of iron droplets, um, and that methane would go away and you'd have a lot of carbon monoxide. So really, just by moving Jupiter closer to the sun, you would completely change what it looks like and what its bulk characteristics are. On the other hand, if you just tried to change Jupiter's mass, if you went from one Jupiter mass to two Jupiter masses, it wouldn't change at all. The size of Jupiter wouldn't change, its radius would be about the same. Basically all giant gas giant planets are the size of Jupiter no matter what you do to them. And uh, you know, the, the temperature of the atmosphere wouldn't change at all, so all of the chemistry, all of the clouds, all of the uh, molecules that are in chemical equilibrium on the planet, those wouldn't change either. So even though uh, Doppler radial velocities and transit techniques and things like that are really trying to understand the masses of planets and where they are, when you talk about characterizing an exoplanet, it's temperature that counts. Now, uh, if you were to take a spectrum of these planets, we can't actually resolve the planets in other solar systems. They just look like little points of light. If you were to take a spectrum of these planets uh, as you move Jupiter closer to the sun, this is what they would look like. So at the bottom here, oops. At the bottom here, you've got actually Jupiter's spectrum. If you moved it closer to the sun, its spectrum would look a little bit more like this. You'd have the ammonia absorption would go away and you'd be completely dominated by methane absorption, deep features. If you got even closer, those deep features would go away and they'd sort of be muted by the cloud coverage. And then hotter still, you would actually look a little bit like a star and you'd be dominated by things like titanium oxide absorption in the optical. So again, the appearance would completely change as, as, as you change the temperature. Now, what do I mean when I say cold? Look at our own solar system and think about it in the context of the extrasolar planets that we're studying right now. So um, here are the temperatures of planets in our own solar system. Mercury, at least on the day side, is quite hot. Venus, with its thick atmosphere blanketing the planet, that's quite hot. But then as you move further away, um, everything's sort of below 300 Kelvin. And in the context of the planets that we study today, that is really cold. So that's part of the motivation for studying uh, the coldest planets, for trying to push in that direction. Here's what the planets look like today. So this is from exoplanets.org. I downloaded, this is the current population of planets as of a, a few days ago. And uh, the different colors uh, tell you about different, different, different ways that they've been discovered. So the red ones have all been discovered by the transit technique. And so there are a whole lot of low mass things close to the star. So this is, this is distance away from the star and this is planet mass. There are a whole lot of uh, rocky and super Earth type planets close to the star, but they're very hot. There are a whole lot of uh, what are known as hot Jupiters. Earth on this diagram would be about here. So all of these things are much closer in. Uh, if you just take Earth and you move that closer in, you get something that's kind of like Venus. So you've got a lot of things like that very close in. Uh, these blue ones have been found by the radial velocity technique, but so far we don't have a really good way of characterizing them. So uh, when you do hear about planet characterization, there are ways of, of characterizing these ones that are very close in. Um, but you are talking about characterizing things that are 1,000 Kelvin or 2,000 Kelvin, not like our own solar system, which has you know, the most interesting planets are 300 Kelvin or 200 Kelvin or 100 Kelvin. So that's a real motivation to push towards, towards colder exoplanets. The other reason to push towards cold exoplanets is because they are physically and chemically complex, which just makes them more interesting to study. So um, if you look at this diagram right here, I've got temperature on the x-axis and pressure, which you can think of as height in the atmosphere, on the y-axis. And um, basically, these are, these are curves for the temperatures of different atmospheres uh, with height in the atmosphere. So they get colder as you go up. And uh, wherever they cross these dashed curves, those are condensation curves for various molecules. So for example, um, if you cross, uh, if you're in the 1700 Kelvin atmosphere, 
when you move up to about a few bars, so this is about the this is about the pressure level where you can see into the atmosphere. You'll you'll cross these magnesium uh, silicate th the, the, these these silicate things and uh, silicate actually sand and dust will condense out in the atmosphere and you will get clouds. And as you get colder and colder, there are more of these things that you can cross. And the best one is water, which is down here. Once you cross a water feature, that's where all of the weather comes from in the Earth's atmosphere. And that's just because water has a really large latent heat. So um, the, the chemistry allows things to condense. And when things start to condense, you get weather. And uh, the physics and the chemistry start to get really complex. So here um, are some levels of clouds in uh, various atmospheres. For a cold atmosphere like Jupiter, uh, you can only see down a few cloud decks. So we're sort of theoretically inferring that there are more clouds below it. But we expect that all of these clouds exist somewhere in Jupiter's atmosphere. Um, and while you get to the hotter planets, uh, there's sort of fewer clouds. There's less weather going on. So there's less complexity. So why do we want to characterize cold exoplanets? Well, to me, it's because the temperature rather than the mass determines the characteristics. And um, within our own solar system, the, most of the planets are cold. So the normal planets, the things that we want to put our own solar system in context, they're cold, and that's what dominates their appearance. And then a lot of the interesting physics and chemistry, and since this is a SETI Institute colloquium, I'll say biology, starts to happen at the colder temperatures. So I already said that most exoplanets are hot. So how can we go about studying colder exoplanets? And I talked a little bit about this population here. These are all transiting planets. They've been primarily found by the Kepler spacecraft. Here are these radial velocity planets. They've been found mostly by uh, the WM Keck, Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Um, and all of, everything that's closer than 1 AU is probably going to be pretty hot. And everything further away than 1 AU is probably going to be pretty cold. And you, if you look up here, there's some fairly massive planets that are very far away. And those are uh, the directly imaged planets. There are only a handful of them. You can see we found tons of transiting planets. We found tons of radial velocity planets. We've only found a handful of these directly imaged planets. But those are the things that probably are the most similar to the planets in our own solar system. And those are the things that we hope to really be able to characterize in detail. So um, then the next question is, are these directly imaged planets really closed? And it's, it's not quite that simple. In fact, uh, in the 50s and 60s, people started using infrared cameras to look at plants in our own solar system, like Jupiter. And what they noticed was that Jupiter is actually much hotter than it should be it's, than, it, than its equilibrium chemistry. So if you just put a ball of gas and you left it forever at Jupiter's separation from the sun, it would be colder than it is right now. And by looking in the infrared, you could infer that there was some residual heat left over from its formation. And so in fact, these plants that are far away, they can have some of that residual heat left over. They, that's actually what dominates their temperature. So this plot right here shows the age of planets versus the temperature of planets. And then I have different masses as different colors right here. So if you look, at, if you, if you look here at the bottom, something like a two Jupiter mass planet, a four Jupiter mass planet, a six Jupiter mass planet, they start out pretty hot, um, 1,500 Kelvin even. Uh, when they're very young, and then they cool off with time. So imagine that you look, are, are doing your direct imaging project. You look at a nearby star, and you see a faint dot around it. That's what we all want to do. And let's say it's about 1,000 Kelvin. So 1,000 Kelvin can correspond to a lot of different masses, depending on how old the planet is. So if the planet is 10 mega years old, you just found a three Jupiter mass planet. That's fantastic. Uh, if, the star, if the planet is more like a giga year old, old, let's see, that's in the green, that's more like 20 or 30 masses, that's not, uh, that's not really a planet at that point. That's more like a brown dwarf. It's close, it's somewhere in between being a planet and a star. So for that reason, when people like me go out and plan their direct imaging surveys, they try to look around young stars. And so when we, when we, when we look for a planet around a young star, we'll, we'll preferentially choose the stars that are 100 mega years old, or 10 mega years old because the planets there are hotter and therefore they're brighter. And so the very small handful of planets that we've found so far tend to be hotter than sort of the average plants in the solar neighborhood. If you just looked at a random star in the solar neighborhood, on average they're about five giga years old, uh, and you looked at what a planet's temperature is down there, it's off the plot, but it would be something like 100 Kelvin. We generally don't have the sensitivity to see things that cold. 
And so we're actually, even when I'm talking about cold, oftentimes the directly imaged planets are still up in this regime, which we would consider very hot in our own solar system. So here's the gallery of directly imaged planets so far. Um, there are uh, a lot of definitions for what an extrasolar planet is, and there are a lot of weird ones that people have found, things that are 15 Jupiter masses around a very small star, around binary stars. So I'm not showing everything that's out there, but these are sort of the quintessential ones. HR8799, 2 mass 1207b, 51 Airy b, GJ504b, this is Beta Pictoris, and this is uh, HD95086. Um, and so these are sort of the prime candidates that we now have to study. We, spent, we invest a lot of time, a lot of telescope time, into finding each of these objects. And once we find them, we really would like to characterize them in great detail. That's the main thing that we're here to do. It's not just about finding exoplanets anymore. It's about characterizing them. So let's look at what the temperatures of these exoplanets are. About 1,000 Kelvin. These are, this is a four-planet system. These three are about 1,000 Kelvin. This one's a little bit cooler, maybe eight or 900 Kelvin. 900 Kelvin, 700 Kelvin, 1,000 Kelvin, 1,700 Kelvin. I mean, that's, that's actually as hot as, as many stars. That just happens to be a very young planetary system. Um, and the coldest one right now is about 500 Kelvin. So what can we learn from these planets right now? To first order, we want to know what they look like. These are, these, are, these are extrasolar worlds. These are real places. What do they look like? What are their characteristics? And we also want to know what they are made out of, because if you can learn what they're made out of, that can tell you something about how they formed. So uh, to first order, what would you expect an extrasolar planet to look like? We, uh, in the last 10 years, we can take a picture of an extrasolar planet. We can measure their colors at different wavelengths. For the first time ever in human history, we can, we can figure out what an extrasolar planet actually looks like. What do we think they're going to look like? And so um, if we go back to this plot, this uh, is, is sort of the first order way that we would think about what an extrasolar planet would look like. Um, if you look around the solar neighborhood, there's a large population of brown dwarfs. These are things that are a little bit more massive than a planet, say 20 Jupiter masses and up, and a little bit less massive than a sun, so say an upper limit of you know, 80 or 90 Jupiter masses. And if you look in the, if you look in the solar neighborhood, so you know, the universe is 13 billion years old, so if you look in the solar neighborhood, you're, you're on average going to be somewhere around here. There, there's a large population of things that range from, say, 10 Jupiter masses, 70 Jupiter masses. You can look all throughout this range, and you can see all varieties of objects of these uh, uh, that are, that are uh, a, a large range of temperatures, but they all tend to be old. So um, we have spectral class classifications for these objects. M dwarfs, which are mostly stars, but the, the lowest mass ones are, uh, can be brown dwarfs. L dwarfs, T dwarfs, and Y dwarfs. Those basically have the characteristics I showed you earlier on where you move the planet um, from far away from the star, from Jupiter far away from the star towards the star. And so um, if you find an extrasolar planet that's 1,000 Kelvin, and let's say it's you know, six Jupiter masses, it's, it's you know, about 20 or 30 mega years old, great. What do you think that should look like? To first order, I've told you that temperature is what counts, not mass. So you can just sort of slide along on this x-axis. You're going up in age, which means you're going up in mass, but you're keeping the temperature the same. And if you had a 40 Jupiter mass brown dwarf that was 1,000 Kelvin, you would expect it to look a lot like an extrasolar planet that's 1,000 Kelvin. That was our original expectation. And so um, the short answer is that, of course, they don't. Um, that would have been too easy. So uh, these are color magnitude diagrams. There are a few different ones, and maybe we can just concentrate on the center one. So um, these are H and K minus colors. So redder is towards the right, bluer is towards the left. And then this is the luminosity of the object. So this is very bright, and this is very faint. And um, I've got different types of brown dwarfs in these uh, black symbols. So at the very top, you've got these M dwarfs. And what happens is that it, you take a brown dwarf, it slowly cools off as it, as, as, it, as it ages. So not only is this a temperature sequence, but it is also an age sequence. If you, if you start out up here, the brown dwarf will slowly cool, and it'll eventually become an L dwarf. And then somewhere at the end of its uh, being an L dwarf, um, something happens, and it quickly becomes more blue. And what we think is going on is that clouds are actually sinking below the photosphere. So we have these silicate clouds 
uh, lofted up into the, into the photosphere. And when, when the brown dwarf gets cold enough, they actually drop below. Um, and you get a cloud-free atmosphere. And clouds tend to make things red. So all of a sudden, you shift over a little bit to the blue when the clouds suddenly go away. And then you continue to cool down colder and colder T dwarfs. Now, if you look at the extrasolar planets, there aren't very many on this plot yet. They're very hard to find. Everyone is precious. But you'll see that there, there's actually a cluster right here where there are no brown dwarfs. So the brown dwarfs, they cool off. The clouds go away. But for the planets that are approximately the same brightness, uh, they, they seem to hold on to their clouds a little bit longer. So that's the first thing we noticed. The first time we ever took an image of an extrasolar planet, we said, huh, these colors are, are funny. It shouldn't be this red. And now we're finding more and more things, and, and so this is an even weirder one. I mean, there's, there's nothing anywhere near there. It's, it's a completely different color. I mean, that's the first order thing you can do, is just look at the color of a planet. It's a completely different color than any of the other cold objects we know about. So what astronomers have been doing is measuring these extrasolar planets in as many colors as we possibly can. So um, here's an example of, that, of, of plants in that four-planet system, HR8799. And uh, here was a, a paper I did where we added uh, six new wavelengths. Uh, we imaged the planets in six new wavelengths to try to understand its colors more. So this is the broad wavelength range from one to four microns. And then this is a zoom in on the new filters we did that we thought would be particularly critical for distinguishing between atmospheres. And um, what we found is that some of the fairly simple uh, model atmospheres that can explain brown dwarfs, you need to add more and more parameters to fit an extrasolar planet. So um, these particular extrasolar planets, we think that they have um, clouds at temperatures where they shouldn't. If you look at the brown dwarf sequence, the clouds have already gone away. But in this case, we think they still have clouds. We think those clouds have to be patchy. That's a new knob we didn't have to use before. And we think there's some sort of non-equilibrium chemistry. So we think there should be carbon, there should be methane on these planets, but instead all of the carbon has ended up in carbon monoxide. And so for example, uh, right here, this is a big methane feature. The blue model shows us where we think there should be a lot of methane. In reality, there's, there's very little, and we were able to you know, obtain new photometry and, and, and get models that, that go through all these points. So um, we're, in an, we're in an awkward position right now where every time we get a new photometry point, it seems like we need a new atmospheric model, which is to say that the atmospheric models are no longer, are not predictive right now, and we are completely data driven. So that's the first thing that we do with extrasolar plants. We measure their color, then we measure a lot of different colors and try to understand something about their broad properties. The next thing you can do with an extrasolar planet is measure its molecular composition. So, um, in this case, uh, this is a paper by Quinn Konopaki. Uh, Quinn and her collaborators have taken this black spectrum and compared it to this green model. And there are a lot of little wiggles in here, which you, you might think is noise. But if you stare at this long enough and stare at zoom-ins, I promise you that a lot of these little features seem to line up between the green model and the black data. And those features are caused by water, methane, and carbon monoxide. And so now for the first time, you can measure the compositions of a couple of molecules in, in these atmospheres, sort of the easy ones right now, the things that we, we expect water vapor is very abundant in objects of this temperature. The next thing you can do, so now we've done imaging, we've done uh, a little bit of spectroscopy. The next thing you can do is do high resolution spectroscopy, which is to say you split up the light into more wavelengths, you spread it out even more. And uh, at that point you get something called Doppler broadening which is to say that the planet is rotating. And so one side of the planet is, the side that's going towards you is blue shifted. The side that's going away from you is red shifted. And that broadens all of the spectral lines. So if you take one spectral line and look at it very, very carefully, at very, very high signal to noise, you can um, actually measure this Doppler broadening. And that tells you how fast the planet is spinning. And so that's very important because it can tell us something about the angular momentum of the planet and how the planet formed. Here's our own solar system, and you've got uh, the, the, the planets in our own solar system and their spin velocity versus mass. And then here's this massive planet, Beta Pictoris b, more massive than Jupiter. And you see that it has a much higher spin velocity. It's also very young. So we think that planets probably spin very fast when they're young, and then they slow down as they, they, they slowly contract as they age and, and at some point lose some of their angular momentum. 
we think that um, we can start to measure this right now with this technique. Um, the next thing, which is even more fantastic that you can do at very high spectral resolutions, is you can sort of make maps of extrasolar planets. This is actually done on, an, on, on um, it's, it's not a planet around another star, it's more like an isolated brown dwarf, but this is a technique that we want to be pursuing in the next few years. And so this is the same thing. You've got one side of the planet moving towards you, that's blue shifted. One side of the planet is moving away from you, that's red shifted. Now, if there's a little dark cloud on the blue shifted side, you'll get a little bit less light in the spectrum at that wavelength. And then slowly that will rotate onto the red shifted side, it'll move away from you. And you'll, at that point, you'll get a little bit less light on the red shifted side. And if you do this very carefully, you can actually make maps of extrasolar planets. So this is the first one like this, and this is for a very nearby brown dwarf. Um, but we are working on new instrumentation uh, that would allow us to take an image of a planet and feed it into a very high resolution spectrograph that would allow us to make maps like this for extrasolar planets. Okay. So I promised to talk about cold extrasolar planets. This is the, the, currently the coldest directly imaged planet. So um, it's not that cold, it's 500 Kelvin. It's still hotter than the Earth and most things in our own solar system. Um, but this is sort of the state of the art right now for directly imaged planets. So this is GJ504b. Um, it orbits um, about 50 AU away from a sun-like star. And uh, I have two different stretches here. Usually I'm, I, I show this to show Basically, these are, this is the diffraction pattern of the large binocular telescope. Um, all of these airy rings show you that the adaptive optics performance is completely superb. And then I, I change the stretch. So basically, this, this is all with a logarithmic stretch, and then I change over to a linear stretch, so you can see this very faint dot right here. And the star in this case is a million times brighter than the planet. So that's really incredible. And the planet is only two arc seconds away. It's extremely close to the star. So this is really incredible adaptive optics performance. And for this 500 Kelvin planet, you can just barely see it above the noise. And you could imagine that if it was a 300 Kelvin planet, you know, forget it, we'd have no chance. So um, this is really at the edge of what we can do right now, and we want to we eventually push down towards colder things. So right now, we can barely do this. This, this. this image right here was several hours on the large binocular telescope, which is the biggest telescope in the world. And uh, we managed to do it at a few different wavelengths. That means every time you do a different wavelength, you're spending another night observing this thing on this very expensive, very large telescope. Um, but this was so exciting, the, the, the coldest extrasolar planet, we got nights to do multiple filters at once. I was involved with these, a few of these longer wavelength filters, and then uh, other telescopes did these shorter wavelength ones. So you can see that at the longer wavelengths, the planet becomes very bright. That's because it's very cold, and cold things tend to be redder, more into the infrared. So we really struggled and uh, managed to get a few different photometry points. You can see these enormous error bars. This is, we're right on the edge of what's possible right here. And uh, we applied these new uh, model atmospheres to it. These are models by a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, Caroline Morley. And um, we actually managed to get a pretty good fit to all of the different photometry points, which is very exciting, right? We, we've never looked at a 500 Kelvin exoplanet before. So to just take out some model atmospheres and tweak them and actually be able to understand the bulk properties of this extrasolar planet, that's very exciting. And so um, we did a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo fit to understand all of the various parameters. And, and I'll just summarize some of these results. We, we can constrain its temperature pretty well. We think it's about 500 to 550 Kelvin. Um, we have some different cloud models and essentially what this plot is telling you is that there are clouds on this planet. It's, it's dustier than most things would be um, at this cold temperature. Um, it's probably pretty young, and I'll say that there's some debate about that in the literature. People think that the host star might look old, but I'll at least say that the planet atmosphere itself looks young. Um, and then this one's the most exciting one to me. Uh, the planet's metallicity is reasonably high. So this is a metallicity in log space of 0.6, which is about a factor of three, so that's, what, that's sort of what Jupiter is. Basically, this planet has a metallicity of 0.6. The stellar metallicity is only 0.1. And so what that is telling us is that the planet formed of different materials than the star. And this is the first time we can say this for a directly imaged planet. And it's very important because there are different mechanisms for forming planets. For example, if you form by what's a very popular mechanism, core accretion. In core accretion, you have, um, dust and solids and little planetesimals 
uh, grow and con conglomerate and eventually become a core of a planet. And then the surrounding medium accretes around it. And so you can imagine that that formation pro pro process would segregate materials differently than forming a star where you just collapse everything in a big ball of gas. Um, there are other formation mechanisms too, and a lot of them predict that you would have different metallicities for the planet than for the star. And the reason this is interesting is because um, you do form binary stars. So how do I know that this thing didn't form like a binary star? You had the main star collapse over here and the little small planetary mass thing collapse over here. Then they would probably have the same compositions. They would form from the same cloud of gas and uh, all of the material would collapse here, all of the material would collapse here, you would get the same metallicities. The fact that this looks like it has a different metallicity than its star is telling us that it formed like a planet. And I think this is the first time that you can say this with a, with, with a wide separation planet like, like this, that this thing formed like a planet. And that's, that's very exciting. So um, what do we have to do to push to colder planets? This is 500 Kelvin right now. Things in our solar system are much colder. And uh, the short answer is that you need to be looking at longer wavelengths. And here's why. So on the x-axis, I've got wavelength that goes from 1 to 5 microns. Um, and on the y-axis, I have contrast compared to a G-type star. So um, the, the up here, um, these are easier contrasts. So you only have to be able to see 100 times fainter than the star. Down here, you have to be able to see a million times fainter than the star. And again, this is just a technological problem. How much faint, you know, can we see something very faint next to something very bright? So um, what this is showing us is that the hotter planets are easier to see, as expected, they're brighter, and also that planets tend to get brighter at longer wavelengths. And so I have this for a, a few different examples of different types of planets. The hottest planet we've ever directly imaged that is unambiguously a planet is about 1600 Kelvin. It's almost as bright as a star. And even in that case, you can see that at the longer wavelengths, it's a little bit easier to see than at the shorter wavelengths. And then as you move to, uh, this is sort of uh, the other popular planetary system, HRI 799, which has four planets. Um, if you form by something that's like core accretion, that planet formation mechanism I just mentioned, it's hard to make something hotter than about 700 Kelvin. So we think that those planets would be on the cooler side. If you just took a planet, any sort of planet, and uh, let it cool off for five gig years, so that now you look at one of the nearest by stars, it's probably about five gig years old. The hottest a planet could be around that star, um, a self-luminous planet could be is about 400 Kelvin. And then when you start talking about Jupiter, you're all the way down at 130 Kelvin. And now you can see, I mean, it's completely red. Um, this is orders of magnitude brighter between four and five microns than it is at the shorter wavelengths. And so astronomers tend to work at the shorter wavelengths for, for two reasons. One is because the sun and other stars emit a lot of light in the visible and near infrared. The planets just happen to be at longer wavelengths. And the second reason is that it's much easier. By the time you get to these longer wavelengths, the Earth's atmosphere becomes bright. Um, your telescope mirrors become bright. Everything becomes much more difficult when you work at these longer wavelengths. So the, stellar, the people who study stars and galaxies, they all want to work at the short wavelengths. But the exoplanet people want to work at the longer wavelengths. And that's causing us to develop new types of instrumentation specifically for exoplanets. Now, just to drive this point home, that hottest planet up here, 1600 Kelvin, that should be the easiest one to do at the shorter wavelengths, right? It, 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 it looks a little bit easier at the longer wavelengths, but it's still possible at the shorter wavelengths. The problem gets worse as you get colder. So that 1600 Kelvin planet, here are two images of it that we took simultaneously. So um, on the left, you have an image that we took at one micron, and I'll, I'll, I shouldn't put the laser pointer on it, otherwise you won't be able to see it. It's right there. Um, because we know where it is, we can measure its, its brightness there, but you would never discover it at this wavelength. Um, and then at the longer wavelengths, here it is at five microns. You can ignore these little lobes on the side. That's part of the data reduction process that we use to, um, to extract very high contrast planets because we've removed the light of the star already. And, and so what you see is that it, it, it's much, much brighter at five microns. It's much, much easier to see there than it is at shorter wavelengths. And this was taken on the same night with the same adaptive optics correction and the same turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. We took these simultaneously, two different cameras working at different wavelengths. It's much easier to see the planet at five microns, and that is going to become uh, more and more important as you get down to colder and colder exoplanets. So um, 
like I said, most astronomical telescopes tend to uh, focus on the optical and the near-infrared. And for exoplanet characterization, we're now in this new regime where we have to build instruments that aren't workhorses to study all areas of astronomy. They have to be specifically for extrasolar planets. And here are the two ways that you can do that. Um, so on the left, I've got uh, you know, my, my previous plot, which basically just says work at the longer wavelengths. The optics are a little bit more difficult. The detectors are more difficult. The sky brightness and mirror brightness is a little bit more difficult, but it's still worth it. And then the other, the other technique is to use what's called an integral field spectrograph. And an integral field spectrograph images at multiple wavelengths at the same time. And so what happens is that the noise, the diffraction pattern from the telescope tends to change with wavelength and any astrophysical object will stay the same size. I'll explain this a little bit more in the next slide. So um, these are the two best techniques. People have done this at one and two microns, but never at the longer wavelengths. And then people have built imagers that have worked, have worked at the longer wavelengths. So um, before I moved to California, I was at the University of Arizona, and I built a new instrument there called Arizona Lenslets for Exoplanet Spectroscopy. This isn't an Arizona room, but uh, that's the University of Arizona logo made out of beer bottles. <laughs> so this was an instrument that I, I, I did as a postdoc, and it was specifically to characterize extrasolar planets at these longer wavelengths. That's going to allow us to find colder planets and allow us to characterize colder planets at these long wavelengths. So this is how an integral field spectrograph works. There are a few different ways of doing it. So um, the first way is the one we're going to end up using. You basically take your picture, instead of taking a picture onto a camera, you take it onto a lenslet array. So this lenslet array is a, a two-dimensional array of tiny little lenslets, and each lenslet uh, captures its little area of the image and focuses it into a tiny little dot. And then each of these dots is dispersed with a regular spectrograph. And you, ori you, you basically make the lenslets and the disperser, you orient them at just the right angle so that none of these spectra will overlap and you can extract them individually. So now uh, this spectrum right here is you know, this part of the image right here. And then you can uh, take this and do a weird processing and turn it into a data cube, and you will get uh, the image at multiple different wavelengths. That's the one we're going to end up using. We'll go through the other ones, too. Um, you can put a fiber behind each of the lenslets and make it into a slit. The good thing about doing that is that you can use all of the pixels on your detector, and the detector is the most expensive part of, of most astronomical instruments. So this is the efficient way of packing it. On the other hand, you have to use fibers and when you're working at these longer wavelengths, fibers don't work very well, and you'd have to make them all cryogenic. So that, that method is sort of impractical. And then there's this method called an image slicer, where you can imagine you have a mirror that has basically, it, it, it changes angles as you move up in the stack. And that will also re-image you onto a slit and use all of your pixels. That works at any wavelength. Um, but those are sort of difficult to fabricate, and they often have more aberrations. So, People who study galaxies who don't care about the perfect image quality, they can use image slicers. But for exoplanet people, we need the best possible image quality if we're going to be able to see something that's a million times fainter than the star. So we're going to end up using the top one. And um, I did this with an existing instrument. This, is, this was an instrument called the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer. Um, I probably should have put in a picture of the Large Binocular Telescope, but it's a, it's a 2 by 8.4 meter um, telescope in one building. It's an 11 story rotating building on Mount Graham in outside of Safford, Arizona. Um, and between the two mirrors, it's the biggest telescope in the world. So there was, the, it's, it's got a fantastic adaptive optic system, it's got fantastic science cameras. And so um, I tried to build this instrument by just squeezing optics into an existing instrument. That's sort of the fast way of doing this. You know, the, the Moore's law for exoplanet studies is very, very short, and the time it takes to build an astronomical instrument is quite a bit longer. For the Keck telescopes, which UC Santa Cruz runs, I would say we build a new instrument every five to ten years. Um, these ex instruments are expensive and difficult to build, and you want to get everything right. But the exoplanet field, we, we need to be moving much faster than that, so it's all about sort of quick fixes right now. So um, we just installed a few different optics into an existing instrument. So on the left, we have basically an image of the star from an existing instrument. And now I already told you that integral field spectrographs waste a lot of pixels and pixels are valuable. So by wasting a lot of pixels really just means that we have to magnify the image because every pixel on the original image is going to turn into a whole spectrum that takes up hundreds of pixels. So the first thing we do is insert some optics that magnify your image. 
The next thing we do is insert that lens lit array that divides up the image into a lot of different dots. And then, uh, it might be a little bit hard to see here, but you disperse all of those lenses into short little spectra and put them close together, but not touching, so that you can extract each one individually. So uh, ALES uh, is, is now on the Large Binocular Telescope, and we had first light about a year ago. And um, here's the image. This is, this is an image of Io, which is one of the moons of Jupiter. And um, if you look right here, this is the, this is the disk of Io, so it's, it's a circularly shaped moon. And then here is a zoom in on a volcano on, my, on Io. So Io has active cryogenic cryovolcanoes. And um, this integral field spectrograph, it's the first one in the world that works at these wavelengths from three to four microns, which is great for any sort of planetary science, particularly exoplanets, but here's an example from our own solar system. And so um, if you kind of look off of the volcano, you'll see that um, you know, they sort of start out a little bit brighter at this end and then get fainter. If you look on the volcano, the colors look slightly different. So this is what the raw data looks like. And then uh, we have to go in and basically take this pixel and this pixel and this pixel and this pixel and this pixel, the bottoms of each spectra, and turn that into an image, and that makes one wavelength. And do that for all of the different parts of the spectrum and turn it into a data cube, and then this is what it looks like. So that same image turns into this. So this is IO um, at, at many different wavelengths from 2.8 microns going to 4.2 microns. And at the shorter wavelengths, Again, this is one image. This, this all took two seconds with the Large Binocular Telescope, and then we're extracting many different wavelengths at the same time. So uh, at this wavelength, you're seeing reflected light from the sun mostly. And then as you get to longer wavelengths, the reflected light from the sun starts to die down, and thermal emission from that volcano tends to, starts to pick up. And so I'm not so much a solar system observer, but uh, people are constantly monitoring the volcanoes to see you know, how they're changing, when they're turning on, um, on Io. And one of the things that's very difficult, I've participated in these, in these observing runs, is you want to measure them at a lot of different wavelengths so that you can measure the temperature of the volcano. But while you're doing that, Io is rotating. And so making a 2D image at many different wavelengths uh, is very, very difficult to do. This allows you to do it all in one shot. And when you talk about exoplanets, it's the same thing. Every one of those wavelengths that I did, that I showed you earlier on when I was doing GJ504, I said each of those took half of a night. Uh, it's a lot of time on a telescope. It's, it's, it's hard for an individual astronomer to get more than one or two nights on a telescope per year. Half a night per filter. Now I can go and do all of the filters at once. And, I, and that's, that's where we're really going to start to see gains, the multiplexing of being able to study extrasolar planets. So uh, this is what it looks like with a single 8-meter mirror. Um, we actually have the ability with that telescope to make sharper images by combining the two. I said it's two 8.4-meter mirrors. If you can combine them, you can make even sharper images. So that mode I showed you before was the first mode. I built that when I was a postdoc. But uh, the National Science Foundation has, is, is funding us to um, upgrade it substantially. And so it will have different magnifications, all sorts of different wavelengths, all sorts of different spectral resolutions. And we'll be able to characterize things with even sharper quality images. And so there's a lot of great solar system science we're going to do. But um, certainly the main goal of this project um, is to do the directly image plans. And so we already have some data in hand. And uh, maybe next time I'm here, I can show you some spectra of extrasolar planets at those long wavelengths. OK, so these, these are the planets. These are, I, as I said, the coldest exoplanet we know of right now is about 500 Kelvin. By that, I meant the coldest exoplanet that orbits a star. There are free-floating exoplanets as well. And um, so this is a really exciting new result um, that I, I, I just published with the Gemini telescope on Mauna Kea. This is the first spectrum of the coldest object outside of our solar system. This is, a, depending on who you ask, this is an exoplanet because it's five Jupiter masses, or it's a brown dwarf because it doesn't orbit another star. But in any case, this thing, it's basically a free-floating exoplanet. It's only two parsecs, or uh, eight light years away from the sun, and uh, it's 250 Kelvin. So it is actually colder than Earth. And when we took this spectrum from the Gemini telescope, that means that the primary mirror on the Gemini telescope is colder than the thing we're trying to detect with it. So this was an incredibly difficult observation. So um, WISE 0855 is its name. It was discovered just a few years ago with the, the WISE infrared satellite. And um, it's five Jupiter masses. The way it was discovered is basically um, these are two different telescopes, Spitzer and WISE, which are the only two space-based telescopes that can operate at longer wavelengths. This thing is very red. Both of these telescopes work in the red. 
and it's moving very fast on the sky. All of these other stars are basically staying in the same position. But, but, but this, this guy is moving quickly across the sky. It's eight arc seconds per year. So um, based on that, we were able to figure out that it's two parsecs from the sun. It's the fourth closest object to the sun. It's the coldest object outside of the solar system, so coldest compact object. And the, the exciting thing is by the time you get down to 250 Kelvin, that's at the point where you might start to see um, condensed water on a planet. So there's water vapor all over the universe. Um, but by the time you get down to 300 or 250 Kelvin, uh, the water vapor condenses either into ice or into liquid water. So um, we really invested a lot of time looking at this. Just to give you some context, this is what Jupiter looks like at five microns. Um, and so basically, uh, in, in the, if you looked at a visible light image, uh, the holes between the clouds, you can see deeper into the atmosphere. You can, it, and, and when you see deeper in, you can see hotter material. And so if, uh, again, we can never take a picture of something like this outside of the solar system. That's, that's, they're all too far away, that's off the table. We just get a spectrum of a single point of light. But if you were to combine all of this into a single point of light, it would be completely dominated by these bright regions between the cloud-like decks where you can see close in. So uh, this is the state of the art for uh, our own solar system right now. Now, WISE 0855 is the first thing outside of our solar system that is a comparable temperature to Jupiter. So the first thing we want to do is see what it looks like compared to Jupiter. Now, I want to show you what the actual data looks like from Gemini. We might have to lower the lights for this. This is the spectrum of WISE 0855. This, thank you. This took 30 hours. And that white line right here going down, can everybody see it? Barely. It's, um, that's the spectrum of, the, of, of, of WISE 0855. Um, so this took 30 hours with one of the biggest telescopes in the world. And when, when I say 30 hours, uh, the way the Gemini telescope works is that it's in, it's in Q mode. So you basically can specify what weather conditions you need to do this observation. And we said we need the best weather conditions and we need an enormous number of hours to be able to do this. And uh, most of the people at Gemini didn't actually think this was possible. And uh, the first night they observed it, they got two hours. That's about as much as you can observe it in a single night. And then you're gonna have to co-add from night to night. And you could see a very, very faint trace. And I sent it back to the people who scheduled the queue there. And then they observed it every night for the next month. They were very excited by it. So um, this is the faintest object ever detected from the ground at these wavelengths by a factor of five. So uh, everything at the Gemini Observatory had to work perfectly to be able to do this. Um, their instruments, the people executing the programs, the weather. Um, it was very difficult to do. And you can see, I mean, this is uh, quite a bit worse than that image or the spectra that we can get of Jupiter. And right now, I mean, the way that this project works is that I read old textbooks and old papers from 50 years ago about Jupiter, and we're trying to do the same thing as people did with Jupiter. We're about 50 years behind right now. So here it is. Here's the first spectrum of the coldest object. This is the first thing that we think probably should look something like Jupiter. Um, the blue is a model from Caroline Morley at UC Santa Cruz, and the black is our spectrum. Um, most astronomers would complain that that's a pretty noisy spectrum to have spent 30 hours on, but that's what we can do right now. Um, so uh, actually, it's very impressive that a lot of these lines match up. I mean, we weren't even sure if we would be able to see these things. The coldest object with a spectrum at these wavelengths previously was 700 Kelvin. We've now taken a jump all the way to 250 Kelvin. So the fact that our atmosphere models work at all by the time you get down to this temperature is, is um, really surprising, actually. Um, the first thing that we did was we tried to figure out whether this has water clouds on it. So here are two different models. Uh, the orange model is a cloud-free model, and the blue model has clouds in it. And what happens is when you add water clouds to your model atmosphere, it kind of dampens out uh, the spectral features. So um, it looks like the blue model is a better fit. Not that we've gotten everything perfect yet, but if you add clouds to this model, it dampens the features, and that looks more like the data that we have. So that's um, pretty good evidence that there, there probably are water clouds on this, on this object, just two parsecs in here. This is um, you know, some of the first times that we've ever seen evidence for water clouds outside of our solar system. The next thing that we wanted to do was compare it to Jupiter itself. So um, this blue spectrum right here is a spectrum of Jupiter. I had to 
make I had to artificially make the data much worse quality so that you could compare them on the same plot because again the Jupiter Jupiter is so much easier to do these days, and then the black one is uh, is Y0855, and basically if you um, if you look at the longer wavelengths um, it actually looks pretty good. Um, a lot of these features tend to be at the same wavelengths. They're not fitting perfectly. We missed this one pretty badly. Um, but a lot of the other ones, they're happening at the same places between the blue one and the black one. Maybe the, the slope is a little bit different because the temperatures aren't quite the same. So um, we've identified all of these features to be water vapor. This is not the water clouds, but the, the, the planet is basically dominated by water vapor. That's true with the shorter wavelengths too for Y0855. In Jupiter's case, um, there's phosphine absorption at these shorter wavelengths. And uh, 50 years ago when phosphine was discovered on Jupiter, it was, it was very surprising because phosphine is supposed to exist in hotter temperature planets. And it was found on this cold planet, Jupiter, 130 Kelvin. And so what we think happened is that phosphine from deep in the hotter part of Jupiter has mixed up into the surface. And that happens on a faster time scale than, than the chemical reaction that would change pH 3 into P406. This mixing happens on a faster time scale than that chemical reaction. And so Jupiter has phosphine. And we expected to see it on Y0855, and we don't. We just see more water vapor absorption features. So that is telling us that, to first order, uh, Y0855 does not have the same turbulent mixing that Jupiter does. That's another exciting part of this. The last thing that we thought we had a hope of measuring was the deuterium abundance in this. So um, deuterium is very important in uh, even cosmology. Uh, it tells you about uh, the Big Bang and um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, how the elements were created in the first few minutes of the universe. Um, and then deuterium burns. It, it, it uh, goes through a nuclear reaction in anything hotter than, in anything more massive than about 13 Jupiter masses. So if you can see deuterium in something, that tells you about its mass. That tells you that it's less than 13 Jupiter masses. I should tell you that for other reasons, we think that basically just how faint it is, we think that this uh, Y0855 couldn't be, couldn't be more massive than you know, five or 10 Jupiter masses. But in any case, you can measure the deuterium abundance here. In, in our own solar system, the deuterium abundance is important because it varies from object to object in the solar system. Um, basically, the comets and the asteroids have different uh, abundances of deuterium. And if you look at the oceans, uh, the water in, in, on Earth, you can tell something about where it came from just based on the deuterium abundance. So uh, all of the different objects in the solar system have different deuterium abundances. You could imagine that if we could do this for multiple planets in the same solar system, we could determine something about how and where they form. So th that's just three things that we've learned about Y0855. The, the, the models with water clouds in them fit better than the models that don't have that. It's mostly dominated by water vapor, at least the molecular absorption features. Um, we don't see the phosphine that you see on Jupiter, but otherwise it looks very similar to Jupiter. And we sort of have the ability to measure deuterium right here. I wouldn't say we've really measured it. Um, we have the signal and noise to measure it. If I thought we were perfectly fitting all of these model features, I would be more comfortable saying that we've measured it. Really, we, we've just demonstrated that you could measure this and that the theorists now need to uh, better under, you know, make, make better models that fit all of the data before we can really measure it exactly. So um, this project has been very successful, and we're going to go try to do a few more. That's the coldest one. So here are some more Gemini. These are, these are models for some Gemini spectra that we're hoping to get in the next year. Uh, here's Jupiter down here. Here's Y0855. So this is 130 Kelvin. This is 250 Kelvin. Still a bit of a gap there, and we don't have any objects between there right now. The previous hottest object was up here. Coldest object was up here. This is 700 Kelvin. We're trying to fill in this gap right here. And what we're hoping to see, if we obtain spectra at all of these different temperatures, we're hoping to see the water absorption feature, the water vapor absorption feature, get stronger and stronger as you get colder and colder. And then at a certain point, it'll start to get more shallow again when the water vapor starts condensing out and turning into water cloud. So we're hoping to spectroscopically determine what temperature that happens. So this is all a, a real struggle to do from the ground. And you might ask me, why are we doing this from the ground right now when several years from now we will have the James Webb Space Telescope in space? The James Webb Space Telescope is optimized for infrared observations. If you are looking at an isolated object, it, is, uh, it would be able to take a spectrum like that in two seconds. 
if you were looking at a planet that's closer to um, a star, then this telescope doesn't have the same contrast and resolution that our ground-based telescopes do right now. But certainly in terms of sensitivity, um, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be amazing. So, um, you know, we're investing a lot of time right now with, with the Gemini Telescope just to prepare for this. Uh, these infrared telescopes have limited lifetimes, and uh, we learned a whole lot from these ground-based uh, from these ground-based telescopes about what's right and what's wrong in our atmospheric models, and we want to, you know, iterate once or twice before we get ready for the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is coming in a few years. We're very excited about this. This will really revolutionize the field in terms of the coldest objects. Um, again, maybe not the planets that are very close to their stars, but the isolated ones it's going to be really incredible for. The last thing I wanted to talk about was cold, rocky planets. We cannot image a rocky planet right now, but we are all working very hard um, to, to, to design new telescopes and new instruments that are specially, specially designed to do this sort of science. So um, remember, the stars are more like optical and near-infrared. Uh, the gas giant Jupiters are sort of like three to five microns. By the time you get to a cold Earth, the, the best place to look is 10 microns. If you were to take an image of the Earth from outside of our solar system, it would peak in brightness at 10 microns. That's just the black body temperature of 300 Kelvin, which is about our rated of temperature. So um, this, is, uh, 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 this is basically the exact Earth spectrum, and I've put it around Alpha Centauri. Um, there's some news out there Rumors, I'll say, not news. Rumors about a, perhaps a rocky planet around Proxima Centauri. Um, and so that's part of this system, the Alpha Centauri system. So what would it take to image an Earth around Alpha Centauri? Um, I did some simulations for the 30-meter telescope. So this is the next big thing that's being built uh, right here at, at UC Santa Cruz has, has designed the technologies for making the largest mirrors in the world. And so the 30-meter telescope um, we're, we're hoping is about to get under construction. It should be here in about 10 years. And with the 30-meter telescope, here's how many hours it would take to image an Earth. It turns out you can do it pretty quickly around Alpha Centauri. Now, Alpha Centauri is the nearest by star, so that's a huge advantage. If you want to look at a few stars that are further away, it's going to get harder. But one thing that we've learned from Kepler, and we may learn from Proxima Centauri tomorrow, I hear, um, is that planets around these stars are, are common enough that we can count on one being there. And so if you looked around one of the closest stars, it would only take you a couple of hours at 10 microns to image it with the 30-meter telescope, which sort of tells you that it's within the re regime of possible right now. So um, telescope integration time scales as diameter to the fourth power. So today's biggest telescopes are about 10 meters. This is about three times the diameter, so three to the fourth power is... 81, so, you know, two hours times 81, give or take. That's, that's sort of what it would take to image an Earth-like planet today with, with, with one of the telescopes that we have. By the time we have the 30-meter telescope, it would be close to routine, and what would really be exciting is that you could detect it at different wavelengths. Um, if you spent two hours and, and found the planet here, you could go back and look at some of the more difficult wavelengths. Of course, these wavelengths become, where, where you see big absorption features, that's tough to observe from Earth because we have the same absorption features. So um, if you want to try and ob observe at 13 to 14 microns, the Earth has CO2 in our atmosphere. We're trying to observe CO2 in another atmosphere. This, this gets painfully slow. But it is possible, maybe in about 100 hours, you could take an image of an Earth at these wavelengths. You could also do ozone. Ozone is probably a biosignature. If you see ozone on another planet, that's pretty good evidence that there might be life on that planet and uh, water at the shorter wavelengths. So um, it's an exciting time. I think uh, we're just getting going with sort of the free cop planets, but we're, we're, we're now moving to the colder gas giants. And I think within you know, the next five to 10 years, we, we, we will have the technology to image planets around the nearest stars, um, rocky planets. So just to conclude, it's, it's temperature, not mass, that determines a planet's characteristics. And um, the planets that we're studying right now tend to be freaks, but uh, our own solar system has much colder planets. And so that's really a direction that we want to push technologically and scientifically. Um, to do that, cold planets emit most of their light at the thermal infrared wavelengths. Um, 
that's a difficult technology to work with. The optics are harder, the detectors are harder, the Earth's atmosphere is harder. Um, but that's what we need to do specifically for studying extrasolar planets. We need specific instruments to do that. And um, hot off the press results, the, the coldest known object outside of our solar system, which is 250 Kelvin, we've now taken a spectrum of it for the first time. And it shows um, water vapor features. It shows some evidence for water clouds. And it has an, an appearance that actually looks quite a bit like Jupiter. So that's, that's pretty exciting. We're now at the point where we can finally connect um, extrasolar planets to plants in our own solar system. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open for questions. We're going to start here. Hi. So um, in that wonderful uh, logarithmic graph where you had images of Jupiter and Saturn and Beta Pictoris, and Beta Pictoris was represented graphically as a big picture of Jupiter with, with you know, the color shifted red. Right. Right. Um, now, most of these, these direct images, they're all like, one pixel, right? Or or because they look like more than one pixel when they're diffracted and you're showing the slides. But but um when James Webb goes live, let's say there is an uh, possibly imaginary planet around Proxima Centauri or whatever, something like that. Is it possible to get more than one pixel? Because it seems like if you want to do the redshift, blue shift of a rotating planet, you more than one pixel might be helpful for that, right? So, so no, you cannot, there, there is uh, close to no chance in, okay. in, say, the next 20 or 30 years, you would need a kilometer-sized telescope to be able to resolve planets into multiple pixels spatially. The redshift, blue shift thing is, is playing a trick. You're doing it with spectral resolution. And if the planet is rotating, the lines will be a little bit on the red side when it's rotating away from you and a little bit on the blue side when it's rotating towards you. So we have other tricks like that that we can use to characterize these planets. The other one that's sort of interesting is that while the planet rotates, it'll get darker and lighter. So if you can measure the, if you can measure the brightness of the planet very, very, very carefully, you could see clouds or even continents and oceans uh, go in and out of your view as it's rotating around. So the, uh, your last conclusion on this object that's 250 Kelvin, you say you see evidence for water clouds. Is the model there of patchy clouds or uniform? That's a very good question. Um, again, I'm going to say that we're learning a lot from what people did 50 years ago on Jupiter. Um, basically, modeling water clouds is a whole different ballgame than we're used to in, in astronomy. What, uh, most of the clouds that we talk about on extrasolar planets are things like silicate clouds. And what happens when you get water is that there's a lot more of it, and it has a really high latent heat. So you actually cannot wrap a planet in water clouds because, completely in water clouds, because it will heat up the planet inside. And then when that happens, the water clouds will get warmer and they will eventually dissipate. So uh, steady state, you cannot cover a planet completely in water clouds. How we actually modeled that was similar to what people do for Jupiter, which is that you're only looking at sort of those hot spots where you can see between, in Jupiter's case, you're seeing between ammonia clouds, but on this planet, that might not exist. We don't know. Um, so you're looking into the deep regions where you can see really hot, and basically you just put a water cloud at a certain depth in there and, and tune that until you get the right size of the water absorption features. That's what people do on Jupiter, and uh, as astronomers, we're kind of copying them right now, but we don't really know how to do it yet. <laughs> Um, if you were to go after this rumored planet uh, around Proxima, could you use the uh, velocity of the Earth in its orbit to shift the terrestrial lines away from the planetary line? Yeah, so people have talked about this at very high spectral resolutions at 10 microns. You could, you could maybe, especially for something like ozone, which has a lot of different narrow features, you could maybe see a little bit between that. I think at this point, um, we will be photon starved with, with today's size telescopes, and we will take, we, we will need a lot of hours just to take an image with a broad wavelength range. So you wouldn't use that high spectral resolution trick yet, but maybe with a bigger telescope. Well, acknowledging how hard all this is to do, uh, and some of these wonderful conclusions you come to, brings up the question to me of reproducibility. If, if you do the, make the measurement once, given all the difficulty, 
Aren't you a little bit concerned about the fact that if you looked at this, did this whole thing over again, you might get something a little different? I mean, Terrified. If you, if you ask the... Um, <laughs> this is science. I'm, 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 <laughs> if, if you ask an observer, we'll say, hey, I got all this great data, and your models don't fit. It must be your models that are wrong. And if you ask a theorist, they'll say, you guys keep observing at different wavelengths, and you, you're just getting some of the, some of the photometry wrong. You, you know, if you observe them on the same night, so one excuse that you often see, people will observe the same thing and it'll be a little different. They'll say, oh, it must be variable. And that's probably not true. We probably don't have the precision to do that. Um, we try to estimate our errors as best as we can. And uh, they might not be perfect. This is, it, this is very hard to do. Um, reproducibility, I will tell you that if you went to a telescope time allocation committee and said, I want to produce, reproduce Andy Skemmer's results. I'm going to just take the exact same measurements that he did. No way. The, the telescope time is too precious to, to be doing science in that way. And they will tell you, just wait for J James Webb Space Telescope, and you will do it in two hours. <laughs> for that particular one, not for yeah. the exoplanets, right? Um, what's the future of the instrument, ALES, that you show? You show a picture of Io. I love Io because I studied Io in the past. but. Um, I thought there would be something for exoplanets. So could you tell us a bit what kind of exoplanets have been observed with this instrument? And sure. What you so, so really, I mean, it's, it's called Arizona Lenslets for exoplanet spectroscopy. So the goal of the instrument, it's the first three to five micron instrument. I totally understand that that's the best possible thing for an IO observer. Um, but it was designed with extrasolar plants in mind. Um, so building an instrument like this at this wavelength, it had never been done before. There were some new technologies that we had to demonstrate um, making a lenslet array that would make small enough little spots at three to five microns. Um, not everyone believed that we would be able to do that on the first try. So now that we've done that, um, it's actually um, a working instrument. It's on the LBT. We are, uh, it's been there about a year. In that time, there was a major failure of the adaptive optic system, which slowed us down in getting data. But now that's back, and we are uh, obtaining spectra of extrasolar planetary systems. Um, as you probably know from working on this, the pipelines are very difficult. The, um, reducing this sort of data is very hard to do. And so uh, there's a grad student at University of Santa, uh, California, Santa Cruz, working on that right now. Uh, but we do have data in hand, and I expect we'll be able to get spectra of exoplanets. So that's, that's our main project, is getting spectra of exoplanets at these longer wavelengths. Um, but we're now in the process of really upgrading the instrument quite a bit. So um, right now, it only works at very low spectral resolutions, 15 to 20. Um, if you want to look for particular lines at these wavelengths, say like the methane, PQR methane branch or something like that, you would want slightly higher spectral resolutions. And so we have plans to do things like that as well. Good, thank you. Is what you've learned um, changing what you would ask for from James Webb or how you would ask it to be used? Well, this was sort of my point about Moore's law with, with exoplanets is that um, the science moves quite a bit faster than you can build things. So the James Webb Space Telescope took decades to design, and it has technologies that aren't from this year or last year, but from last decade. And the science plans for that instrument were all designed a long time ago, too. Um, so you can't change the instrument, but you can change how you use it. Um, so uh, we're going to look at a few of these things, and we're going to try to understand their, I mean, the, the, you know, these were some very interesting discoveries that now the Gemini Observatory can claim for themselves instead of something like James Webb. Um, but the truth is, there are things that were unexpected there. And now I have an excuse to go to Mark Marley at NASA Ames and say, hey, you need to work on your water cloud uh, atmospheric models. And you know, he, he, he's a co-author on that paper. So um, it's very exciting from that perspective. OK. Uh, Andy, thank you very much for coming here, for giving this interesting talk on the world of uh, coal exoplanets. As a memory of uh, you stay here, oh, please wow. uh, have this wonderful mug and uh, let's have some coffee together with this thank mug. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot.